Sneakers The rubber sole innovation of the late 1800s became pop culture staples by the 1970s and 80s, with models like the Adidas Superstar, Puma Clyde, and Nike Air Force One. But it wasn't until the release of the Air Jordan in 1985 that sneaker fandom became an international obsession. Here at Peep the Kick Sneaker Convention in New Brunswick, New Jersey, resellers feed sneakerheads a voracious appetite for Nikes, especially as Air Jordan line. Resellers act like speculative investors, stocking up on inventory as a bet that prices will rise, sometimes yielding enormous profit. He goes by the name Naughty and sells a reimagined version of an Air Jordan 1 under his own independent clothing label, Global Heartbreak. Small label designers who make products derivative of Air Jordans and other Nike models. Naughty began Global Heartbreak with only $50 to his name, steadily building a following through Instagram over the past six years. In today's decentralized maker's economy, despite running a small independent clothing label, Nadi was able to contract directly with a manufacturer in China to produce his inventory. Although Nadi and T don't produce enough shoes for Nike to take notice, the sneaker giant has been cracking down on derivative designers. The most high-profile lawsuit is against trend-setting fashion brand A Bathing Ape, or Bape for short. Bape is a really important Japanese streetwear brand that started in the 1990s. It was embraced by hip-hop superstars Jay-Z and Pharrell, probably the biggest among them. Brendan Dunn is the editor of the leading online sneaker magazine, Soul Collector, and co-hosts the YouTube sneaker show, Full Size Run. Bape was most known in sneakers for making the Bapesta, which is a version of the Air Force One that replaces the Nike swoosh with a shooting star logo across the side. If you look at the shoe and you know anything about sneakers, you know immediately that's based on the Air Force One. I wanted Bapesta's bad when I was a teenager and I'm happy to own a few pairs now. You know, you put this next to a Nike Air Force One and it should be pretty obvious the DNA of the shoes. So you don't have to be a sneaker obsessive to see the things that these models have in common. This one came first, this one came later. This year, decades after the original release of the Bapesta, Nike finally sued Bape over the design, calling the Bapesta a knockoff Air Force One, saying that Bape was infringing upon Nike's intellectual property trade dress around the Air Force One and asking the court to stop Bape from selling these shoes. And this action from Nike comes amid a wave of recent litigation where they're trying to swat down all these makers who create these shoes that look a lot like Nike shoes and are very much based on the success of Nike shoes. It's hard to know why exactly Nike has been so aggressive recently. I would speculate that there are just more of them now than there ever were before and this looks to Nike like a whole cottage industry that could get out of control. It seems like every six months there's a new version of the Jordan 1 with a different logo on it. We usually think that copying actually destroys incentives to innovate. But in the fashion world, copying is actually what creates the incentives to innovate. NYU law professor Christopher Sprigman is the co-author of The Knockoff Economy, How Imitation Sparks Innovation. In the book, he draws a sharp distinction between copyright, trademark, and trade dress. So copyright protects artistic and literary works. Trademark is about symbols, words, sounds that we use to identify the source of products. Trade dress has a bit of a different flavor to it, which is sometimes the shape of products or elements of the product's construction tell us where the product comes from. Trade dress is enforced in the fashion industry occasionally, but what you get in a lot of lawsuits is some pretty dubious claims of design being recognizable. When these lawsuits happen, inevitably the Nike litigators will come up with screenshots from Instagram comments of people who are are confused and are thinking this is a Nike shoe on some level, but I believe those people are in the extreme, extreme minority and that anybody really spending their money on shoes like this knows that Nike didn't produce them or Nike is not involved. Copying helps set trends, trends sell fashion. Copying is what helps kill trends. Copying is what helps set the trend that comes next. So the fashion cycle runs and the fashion industry's successive waves of innovation depend on copying.
but Spergman sees a big difference between derivatives such as Bapes or Nadi's designs and replicas or reps for short, which attempt to mimic Nike's models exactly, making them a clear case of trademark infringement. I would never ever wear a replica sneaker, but when you think about fake sneakers from the era when I started collecting, they were more obviously fake. A lot of the money spent these days on replica sneakers has to do with recreations of shoes that are not authorized by the companies but still look exactly like and feel exactly like or as close to exact as possible. I think it's definitely ironic if you consider the fact that some of these shoes, the fake ones versus the real ones, are made in the same factory by the same labor force. That is one of the harder pieces to really square away in terms of not wanting to ever wear fake shoes. Videos like this help buyers distinguish between replicas and the real thing. But most sneakerheads aren't fooled by replicas. They buy them knowingly because the differences are so subtle and the real thing is out of reach. So Nike and Adidas, in a sense, have learned what the luxury goods game is about, and they're getting into that game. They purposely manufacture fewer than could be sold. They create scarcity. This scarcity helps create a mania. This mania helps drive up the price on secondary markets. It seems to me that that kind of behavior is going to call forth counterfeits the way rain calls forth flowers. That's just the way the world works. Unlike with knockoffs, Sprigman believes that companies have a legitimate case against replicas, but also sees it as a form of class bias. People should understand what they're getting. But if a person buys a counterfeit and is not fooled, I guess the problem is that you'll be walking out in the world with a very high quality counterfeit luxury good that other people will mistake for the real thing. When they mistake it for the real thing, they will impute to you the status that in a sense you don't have. We have to ask ourselves, are we really in the business of regulating people's status? That's a business that says that the person without a lot of money cannot essentially signal to the world that they have the kind of taste or that they have the kind of means that a person with more money has. This is a way of segmenting us by economic class using intellectual property law as the means and that is a very normatively unattractive thing for intellectual property law to be doing. I do think Nike is doing fine, but I do still think it's in their best interest to combat counterfeits and knockoffs because I believe that does divert revenue away from them. But I feel like Nike's battle against bootleg makers is a game of whack-a-mole more than anything else. Bape is still selling its sneakers, and the company has filed for dismissal of Nike's lawsuit. A handful of other cases have been dropped or settled out of court, with derivative designers agreeing to stop selling their products. It's still not clear if Nike's legal campaign will succeed in shutting down this segment of the sneakers market.